was in filling in a lot of those gaps. And so I, I came here um, a bit by chance. I think I was really paying attention to another historian's footnotes and saw Beinecke a few times and thought, what is that? <laughs> and uh, tracked it down and was able to have a, a short-term fellowship to come. And um, because, as I said, the focus is on the Lesser Antilles as a broader region, what it meant was it give, the collection gives you this opportunity to pull materials from Grenada while you're also pulling materials about Guadeloupe, about Trinidad, and really gives you this expansive view of the Lesser Antilles as a region. The other thing I think it's really, um, I'm sure Christian will have more insights about this, but the material that is that ended up being collected some of it is so unique. And um, one of the pieces that I asked Christian to pull today, this is an oath of allegiance made by French colonial subjects in Grenada in 1765 after the island was conquered by and ceded to Great Britain. It effectively acts as a census of every free person who was living and remained in Grenada in 1765. And this is a manuscript, I believe this would be the only version in the entire world. And so what this means for the patrimony of, of Grenadians, I think, is, is really important um, to investigate because this is a, a really kind of uh, complete look at who among free people was living in the island at this very crucial moment um, that, and I know it's been digitized, so that is great in terms of promoting access. Um, but I, I just think you have such a wonderful treasure trove here, and I'm excited to talk more about access and, and what people have been able to do with the collection. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here today. And I understand why Christian mentioned the warmth in the Caribbean, because it's very cold here. <laughs> I can't necessarily say I reciprocate the feeling for the cold, but... It is a pleasure being able to join my colleagues here at this panel to discuss preserving the historical records of the Lesser Antilles. Because when you're from smaller islands within the region, a lot of emphasis is not necessarily placed on history or preserving some of the primary sources and materials that exist within the islands. I think we have to take into consideration Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So as small developing island states, our priorities have been to meet first basic needs. You have to concentrate on the economic well-being of the islands. You have to concentrate on the social environment. You have to build out your health space, which is a challenge within these regions. You have to build your security and focus on those goals before you can then now elevate to other areas such as you know preserving history as valuable as it is you cannot necessarily tell your population we're about to invest 200,000 into this while not providing for things like healthcare so that's one of the reasons I'm glad to be here so that we can able we are able to discuss how we can continue to partner as well with institutions such as Hamilton who would have came in under with Christian here and some of the team from students at this institution and done some of the digitization work within Nevis. And you might have more resources in terms of space, storage space. We don't have access to even the amount of storage that is required in digital space to host those type of documents. So right now we have a sharing type agreement going where you benefit by accessing our primary resources and we are able to out as well benefit from being able to have those hosted and have similar access to those resources. So this is going to be a good conversation today. I studied at the University of the West Indies and a lot of the focus was Caribbean history. But even within the region, you'd find that Caribbean history tends to focus primarily on Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, the bigger islands. So my class was, you know, like 99% Trinidadians at the time. And I would have to interject, oh, and the Les Antilles, and oh, and St. Kitts and Nevis. 
So I wished that at that point I knew about the Benke collection because I don't think a lot of Caribbean academics even might know that this resource exists. So I would have loved to have been able to tap into that and pull sources and be able to share with the class because the lecturers were always very open as well to learn new information that they didn't have access to. So I think part of the goal of preserving the historical record is also promoting that it's there, how to access it and encourage individuals within the region to use it. Because we have a lot of instances where Caribbean history is becoming more popular, but it's a lot of external individuals writing about us, but it's not being written by us. So that's an interesting conversation to have as well. I'll just turn you over to Christian now. Okay, thank you so much, Chanel. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to be here with these colleagues. And I have to say, Thomas was the best student uh, user of the Beinecke collection. In the 14 <laughs> years I have been here, did just absolutely amazing work. Um, we also should mention, and maybe you did, but Mackenzie Cooley, uh, our great friend, organized this whole series, and particularly this panel, and uh, has just had a very welcome, and joyous addition to her family. So unfortunately, she can't be here today, but we want to thank her for really putting all this together. Um, <clears throat> so when I came to Hamilton in 2009, it was because of my knowledge about communal religious groups. So curating nominally, because we're all curators of all the things we own and love, you know, I think that's a term we can all fill in some way, but to become the curator of the Beinecke collection was a really interesting challenge for me. I had a good general knowledge of Caribbean history, but this required obviously some intensive background reading and a deep dive. Um, some people wonder too, as I did, why is this collection of Caribbean materials in an isolated rural college in upstate New York, perhaps the most cruel place beyond the Arctic <laughs> for anyone interested in the Caribbean to come and use these resources. Well, we were the fortunate beneficiaries of a gift of Walter Beinecke Jr., who was a trustee at the college and had a personal interest in this region and began transferring his materials here as far back, I think, as even maybe the 1970s in a gift that the recently deceased Ralph Sandstrom, uh, our librarian from 1976 to 2000, who just passed away last week, he really shepherded that acquisition. Um, so we need to remember that. Randy Erickson continued that and he hired me and I began getting research requests to use these materials from around the world, Africa, the Caribbean, a lot of places where folks may not have had resources to come here and use the materials. So it became a number one priority to digitize this, the manuscripts in this collection, which Marini de Peasley, who's in the audience, uh, completed by 2012, I wanna say. Um, 17 or 1800 manuscripts. Peter McDonald and then Lisa McFall, who's also here in the audience, they're the ones that make these discoverable and accessible in digital form through these digital collections. So there's a huge group of people involved in getting this work out there. Question was, how do we enlarge the Beinecke collection? Do we? Well, Caribbean manuscript materials, when they come on the market, are prohibitively expensive. And so I began to think, what if what is important about these intrinsically it's i mean that is important but it's the information so can we as a college partner with an under-resourced institution to help them make their collections uh discoverable and accessible and preserve that content and of course nevis was the first island to come to mind because that's where our namesake alexander hamilton was born um and so with um the help of a man named everson hull a Navesian ambassador to um the Organization of American States, and Joe Shelley's predecessor, Dave Smolin, and then Joe Shelley himself, the head of LITS, and a generous trustee donor, we were able to initiate a series of trips to the island to digitize these materials, but most importantly, leave the originals with the people that they belong to. So it's a really satisfying work. Great. Thank you all for, for these introductions. Now we're going to move into the roundtable portion of, of today's talk, where we have several different discussion points, which um, all of you are welcome to, to answer or field a response to any topic, although I will direct certain questions to certain participants to, to speak first. So our first topic of conversation concerns um, kind of topics of diaspora and archive. And this is 
an example of a question that is open to all. We want to just hear whatever you have to think. Um, so how, when we're looking at these archives, when we're constructing them, and most of all, when we are stewarding them and continuing to curate them, as Christian just noted, how do we consider overlapping histories of current inhabitants and ancestral claims to Caribbean histories, especially in light of the entire region's history of intermobility, as Tessa noted on, forced migrations, and cultural mixing? Whoever wants to take this first. Okay, yes, I'll take it first. I think we have to be conscious of the Caribbean region as one space but multiple different spaces all at the same time because we had several instances of mass movement across the region. So you would have ancestry from St. Kitts and Nevis in Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, in Grenada, in Trinidad as well. So we really have to interrogate the information from the local sphere while also making those connections with other islands and other regions. So the idea is to be able to make the data accessible across the region so that you can encourage academics, just individuals who are interested to be able to pinpoint those connections in a way so that we can see the similarities and the relationships that would have formed across borders. You can also attempt to trace things. So if you're looking at maritime history of Nevis, you want to be able to expand your scope and look at where Nevision shipments were going or what shipments were coming into Nevis, and then let that help to guide your path of study. So that's, that's the idea that I think I would like to see in that area. Um, one thought that I had was, um, and Janelle and I were talking about this the other day, with all of the genetic testing now available that helps really drill down into ethnic origins of different populations, we tend to think of the islands as they were possessed by different European powers, were traded, conquered amongst them. Um, but what we forget is in those islands, and the, the manuscript that far left there bears this out, we have the rosters of the enslaved people on these estates. And their nationalities or ethnicities, I should say, when given, if we're lucky enough to have them, we'll say Congo, Igbo, Ashanti, Coromanti, these different things. And that's information where the Caribbean region writ large, those lines are so blurred because of where those people were transported from and then to. And so a greater digital tool for research when that information is present in the sources could make all kinds of interesting connections mm -hmm. that are largely otherwise completely lost in the absence of the new science of, of this genetic research. Yeah, I think this is where um, Janelle's earlier comment about kind of the, the needs of the present day population also comes into play because in addition to the African diaspora, as, as Janelle was alluding to, there's also these diasporas within the Caribbean yes. um, where people who live in one island, their ancestors may have moved there um, for work opportunities or as I'm finding with my current project, their ancestors may actually have been like trafficked from one island to mm -hmm. another as enslaved people um, to an extent that databases that treat people in, in terms of um, commodities. So there is a, a, a database of inter-American slave voyages, but a lot of enslaved people were moved between islands um, by enslavers who carried them between those places without engaging in sale. And so there's certain documents that allow us to kind of perceive that movement that isn't otherwise captured. So all of this is to say, um, people can have ancestry in multiple or roots in multiple islands, we can say, and the present day political situation in the Caribbean, particularly in the Western Antilles, can complicate that um, in terms of access, where we have islands that um, still belong to the European nations that colonized um, these places. So. Um, Martinique and Guadeloupe, for instance, are overseas departments of France. That means that a St. Lucian or a Dominican who wants to go to this island that they can see from the island where they live needs a visa, needs to show they have a certain amount of money in their bank account, needs to say where they're staying. So these, these borders are very, very policed. And a person who might 
be interested in archival documents related to perhaps their personal history that come from one of these neighboring islands may be prevented from accessing it precisely because of these present day barriers. And so this is another way where digital accessibility could really come into play. Yeah, thank you all for, for these comments. And we're, we're hitting on themes of multiple scales upon which, um, and multiple diasporas um, in which we are all working, which um, I invite further questions in the, in the Q and A session about this topic. Moving on to the next topic is largely about today's government and relationship to the past, the present and the future. So we might start with Janelle on this one. Um, so from, in your view, what are the goals of administrators today? And I know you hit on this in, in your opening remarks, um, in maintaining these archives or not and maintaining them in place or not digitally as we have been discussing. Um, and then maybe more poignantly, who uses these and why? Um, and in what ways do different people seek to access these archives and then use them after accessing them. Um, and finally, what does access to history mean for residents of St. Kitts, Nevis, or other neighboring islands? More to the point that you were just finishing on, Tessa, about um, interrelated history, but maybe not interrelated access. I, I believe governments in the region value the information and understands the importance of preserving these types of history. That's why they've kept them secured, oftentimes not in the ideal conditions. So you might find them in a vault someplace, not in the most effective storage boxes or shelved the way we would like it as archivists, but they've kept them secured for them sheer reason that they understand the value of these items. So you would find that at any opportunity to partner and to be able to get a proposal to assist in making those type of documents more accessible and preserving them, most governments, certainly the one in Nevis, would be willing to engage in those discussions. That's again why when the Hamilton College came in, and we're able to partner with the NHCS, that's the Nevis Historical and Conservation Society. Oh, I should give some background on that as well. That is not a government agency, but the Nevis Historical and Conservation Society functions as a sort of historic caretaker in Nevis. So they're not government, but the government understanding and appreciating the value that they add and the role that they play as caretakers to a lot of archive materials, historic preservation, conservation, supports their initiatives, supports it financially and in any other ways that they are able to. So when Hamilton College were able to partner with the NHCS, you, the government, was fully on board to support those digitization processes because they knew that making those accessible both to locals and foreigners was a good step. Also preserving them in that way is essential because again, as I said, the way we house them might have several limitations in terms of how long they last over time. Our grandchildren might not be able to even touch the material without it falling apart. So we understand the importance of that and work consistently to promote and support those efforts. In terms of who accesses this information, as I also touched on earlier, you find that Caribbean history is growing as a field of study. It's becoming popular to look at and how it intersects with American history and colonial history. So you have a lot of external researchers who tap into the island to do research. And one of the limitations I realize that the Historical and Conservation Society is oftentimes researchers come in and they take and do not necessarily leave anything in return. So you take the material, you take the information, but there's no reciprocating what the final product was, what you drew from it, what you learned to give back. You might pay a nominal fee, if any at all. And so we need to be able to 
solidify a policy where when you come in, it's good that others want to access the information, but you also want to leave something behind and make sure that the relationship, we can both reciprocate and benefit from it in that sense. So you have that aspect. You also have a growing sense of awareness with individuals who are from the diaspora, as well as, you know, the younger generation where more people are interested in finding out more about genealogy and their family tree. So you would find individuals trying to tap into those types of records as well, baptismal records, slave records, so that you can see how far back you might be able to trace your ancestry. And that is becoming a relevant field as well. I, I might have lost one of your questions in there someplace. Um, no, I think you I think you pretty effectively hit on the question of um, governmental administration um, of archives, who might access them, and then what do what do they mean? So I, yeah. unless you have anything else to add, I could add something. Yeah. Um, First of all, I should add, Mackenzie's been texting me, and there's apparently no outgoing Zoom feeds, so I don't know if anyone in AV oh, no. is aware of this or not, but um, in any case, to Janelle's point, the most satisfying outcome of this for me, and I think for those of us at Hamilton who staff this project, we've three had three separate occasions where members of the Asian diaspora have found these collections online and passed the word amongst their extended family and have been able to do that genealogical research. And I remember particularly one woman in Florida, just she wrote this effusive thank you letter for you know, putting these records online. She said I, she had found all these different relatives and she said, I found the, the records of slavery sad, but the records of baptism and marriage joyful, you know. And so this is the type of raw material. I might go down there and, oh, there's the surrender letters of Nevis to the French Admiral in 1782. Like, I'm really excited about that. But honestly, that's a well-known story for the other people searching for their family. It, this is really um, kind of a watershed moment here. Tessa, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I think I just uh, want to echo Janelle's point about the importance of um, members of the diaspora and then the importance of government or, or other kind of community organizations in, in promoting access to these materials. It's remarkable within the different islands where I've conducted research, the effect that a, a single invested government official or invested historian can have. So the island of Dominica, for example, which is not the Dominican Republic, it's a different <laughs> island. Uh, it's a small island, about 80,000 people resident on the island. The diaspora is actually much larger. So more Dominicans live outside of Dominica than, than on the island. And um, one Dominican, Lennox Honeychurch, um, went and got a PhD in the UK. And then he went back and made his career on Dominica. And that entailed, uh, as part, you know, um, investing in historical sites and really investing in the archive. And so although Dominica is not a wealthy country by any means, um, their archive there is quite accessible because a very dedicated individual made a catalog and figured out an organizational system. You know, I think your point about hierarchy of needs is so mm -hmm. crucial there where he was able to do that, mm -hmm. right? Which means the other parts of his life were already kind of taken care of, right? right? And so th that's not true in other places. Um, one example that comes to mind is Grenada has such a really, really, really rich archive. And in 2004, Hurricane Ivan took the roof off the archive and it's never been repaired. And so all of the archival material that looks like this or is loose leaf to Janelle's point about, you know, the future generations literally not being able to touch documents because they will they will crumble in your hands because they've been exposed to humidity, worms, you'll see silverfish in the papers sometimes. I mean, just really difficult um, uh, physical preservation. All of those documents were moved to the basement of the Grenada Registry Office, which still operates as the, the registry office for the island. So if you want to do research there, you get in a line of people 
out the door who are there trying to get title to their family's lands in the present day. And so the, the, the archive, such as it is, you know, is, is being held in a place where at least it won't turn to dust, but is not cataloged, is not organized, because that's not the priority. The priority are, are of course, the people there in the present day um, seeking access to their to their family lands. And so um, the my, my experience is that members of the diaspora from these different islands that I've worked on um, are much more invested in this history precisely because having left the islands and, and made their lives often in New York City, they now have time to kind of think about their families, their genealogies, and their history. And so they've been among the more active kind of um, interlocutors for, for my own work. Yeah, but I'm, I'll be interested to see that evolve too. I'd, I'd love to hear more about how you think um, people in Nevis engage or don't with this history. Like, is it of interest to them? And what particularly is of interest? See. In Nevis, see the same Nevis Historical and Conservation Society, yeah. it was basically built upon what you're describing. Individuals who now had made it mm -hmm. in life to say, and they're connected with the island. They have time on their hands. They have money on their hands. They have yeah. interests. And so they now put, gathered themselves together and formed this group with these type of aims. Mm -hmm. They would have adopted different causes. They would have helped to spearhead having an archives within the society so that they can promote. And as a government, but as a people in general, we, are, we always tend to look directly to the government for every solution, mm -hmm. which the government is there to, that is the role. But things can be accomplished sometimes much quicker even more efficiently sometimes when civil society decides that, hey, we have a role to play and we can't do it. So let's mm -hmm. actively get involved and do that. So that would have happened in Nevis in terms of the society. And Nevisions, I wouldn't say a large cross section try to access these materials, but again, a lot of individuals do, and they're very interested in the marriage records and the baptismal records and those type of records that helps to trace their family history and relationships in that sense. This is a great way to access our next point of conversation. Uh, first, do, do we have the Zoom up? It sounds like it. Great. Okay. Um, the next question, if you'll indulge, um, is a bit more about the brass tacks of archival maintenance. Um, so we might start with Christian. And really this accesses some of the points that um, both Tessa and Janelle just finished speaking about, about um, kind of connection and separation, um, the role of, of weather and the environment and um, continual maintenance. So one of the things that makes the Beinecke collection special is that it includes materials from the entire Lesser Antilles as a region, as Tessa remarked on in her opening remarks. However, those who go to the region will quickly note that maritime borders separate many proximate islands from one another, even if you can see one from the next, once again, as, as Tessa noted. So Christian, how does this separation work politically um, for administrators and them for you, I guess, um, this is re really the question for you. How does this affect how you manage collections, how you how you collect in, in, in the first place, um, and, and how from your, your role here at Hamilton, how you go out into the Caribbean to try to, um, to try to increase the, the breadth and, um, and the scope of the Lesser Antilles collection. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we don't add all that much in the way of new physical material to the Bind Key collection. I could exhaust my annual budget pretty quickly buying, you know, good Caribbean material. I had four pamphlets offered to me, uh, printed in the, in the Caribbean in the 18th century. It was $20,000 for the four pamphlets. You know, these are printed things. They're not unique. So I'm not going to spend that money. Um, but what we can bring to bear that I think should have universal appeal across all those borders you mentioned 
is our expertise and the support we can offer. And so Jeremy Katz, who's in our audience, is our archivist. Um, we have a great photo of him in the Nevis Historical and Conservation yes. Society office with the archival box in his hand, a Panama hat on his head, and a giant smile on his face. So uh, he said it's like the archivist's dream to get to go do something like that. And, and so that's where, again, with the support of folks like Joe and our donor, we're broadening our collection in a resource sense by offering these services. Where that goes from here, I'm not sure. It's also an important educational opportunity we can offer. And one of the students that was with us in St. Kitts and Nevis, Emma Tomlins is there. She's still working in the Beinecke collection, even after um, she did the work in the islands. Um, so it, it can be a two-way relationship. The beneficiary can be a student learning. It can be folks like Janelle's talked about in the diaspora. And I think that we would have to partner with islands that particularly are under-resourced. I've noticed a lot of the now core EU islands seem to have better access. Um, Tessa mentioned, you know, the French overseas departments. They're tied into state-run things. Whereas in St. Kitts and Nevis, there was some university-based things coming from England in terms of digitization, but I haven't seen the same kind of national archives related um, mounting of resources from the islands. Mm -hmm. Colonial records in England, different story. Um, but so I think there are some gaps we could fill if we wanted to. Um, and by the way, I have to say in my bio, I said immerse myself in the warm waters of Caribbean studies. I wasn't <laughs> being so blatant as to say actually the warm waters of the Caribbean, even though that was true also. But <laughs> I glossed over the studies, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I hope that answered your question, but um, it does. Okay. If anyone has other remarks, or we can move yeah, to the next. I can chip in on that one because I think what stood out to me is the fact that you talked about how close the islands can be because mm -hmm. St. Kitts and Nevis is one country. It's two islands and there's only a two mile strip between us of ocean. So technically you can stay on Nevis and you can see St. Kitts. We just had a cross channel swim last week actually where hundreds of people came in to swim from one island to the next. So that's how close it is. But even within one country and two islands that close, there's separation of materials. When St. Kitts and Nevis became one space, a united back in 1882, a lot of the records from Nevis would have then been shipped over to St. Kitts to store there. So a lot of our material from Nevis would now be in St. Kitts and we don't necessarily sure you can get access but you don't have the everyday access to it you don't have a transcript of it per se someone would have to go in and actively research that to make it accessible to the average person and so you have that type of separation in terms of once there's a body of water no matter how tiny it creates that divide and we have to actively work to bridge that and honestly the digital space is probably our best bet Thank you both. Um, picking up on something that Christian was talking about, um, one of the key aspects of Hamilton's activities and investments in the Beinecke Lester Antilles collection is to promote student access to these archival materials. Um, so I'm wondering if you could, and um, I could maybe help out, but if we could describe student access to the Lester Antilles collection at Hamilton, both here in Clinton and in places like Nevis and St. Kitts. Sure, yeah. um, it's total <laughs> in one word. I mean, there's nothing we have that a student can't put their hands on. And that can be shocking to some people that experience it, but um, you know, we have a very intelligent student body here in Hamilton. And they surely can be told the basics of how we handle an archival document. And um, I've heard over and over again from our students a number of whom that have worked in special collections and gone on to careers in this type of field, how important that experience was. And, and we're dealing now with students literally in the born digital world where they're learning to read on devices, you know? And so the experience of holding a document in your hand, looking at cursive. Um, I was talking with Professor Laura Tillery from Art History. She surveys her classes. Roughly half of them have never been exposed to cursive handwriting through their elementary and high school schooling. 
Um, so it really is, it's opening up whole new worlds of discovery for them in, in so many ways, historical, cultural, paleographic, um, that I think it's part of what we offer as a, a really well-rounded liberal arts experience. Thank you. I guess I'll give a little bit of a, of a former student's perspective on uh, accessing these collections in that these collections started my career post Hamilton um, and continue to fuel it today and moving forward. Um, the document in front of me is what I wrote my first uh, single author publication on. It's what I used for my graduate school writing samples. Um, so having this, uh, what, five minute walk from my dorm room um, and having the types of access to this to these documents that um, Christian is describing um, can be invaluable during the semester, but also well after a student leaves Hamilton. Um, I still barely understand what's under what's contained in the in this type of document, and um, I do suspect we'll continue to come back to to the Lester Antilles collection for years to come. So this is all to say that um, it's not just as simple as a show and tell. Sometimes this is a, a legitimate. Um, an ongoing source of knowledge and inquiry um, and academic development. Um, so if anybody else has anything to say about this, you're welcome to, or we can move on. So within the, you asked about access to the, to the collection. And to be quite honest, I don't think a lot of people in the region even knows the collection exists, let alone access it. And if you do know it exists and you try to access it, if you do not know what you're looking for in that digital space, it can also prove to be a challenge. So I think part of expanding access to the collection would be to at least partner with the key universities in the West the Indies and the Caribbean. So this collection should be a core aspect of history at the University of the West Indies. So to whoever is in charge of that should reach out <laughs> to the University of the West Indies so that their history students now can know that this resource exists and be able to access and utilize that within say, secondary school, six farmers, college students. I'm not certain any of them would have ever accessed this information within the Federation. And so, Janelle, you're suggesting it, it would be valuable for me to go to Jamaica, Barbados, <laughs> Trinidad, to carry the word, like yes. I carry the URL. Yes, it on yes. <laughs> yes you, can be, it. you can be the shepherd. Okay. Sounds like a, a year of, of uh, work abroad for you. For Difficult, sure. <laughs> sacrifice. Um, I'm now going to turn us to Tessa, where we might talk about multiple colonialisms um, that are contained within each document, the collection of the whole, um, and just history of the region. So many Caribbean islands have complex colonial histories as I think is well established by what we've already been talking about. Um, often having been ruled by multiple European powers, each island contains multitudes in a very real sense. So how do these multiple colonialisms play out in local politics and in history more broadly? What is the interplay between those two threads? Um, what presence do these multiple colonialisms have in, in history we can access about the region and we can create moving forward in partnership with inhabitants of the Caribbean? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's, it's particularly salient for the Lesser Antilles because these were islands that by and large were colonized a little bit later. So when, when Europeans arrived in the Americas, they first went, colonized, the Spanish colonized the Greater Antilles. And it really wasn't until... Um, the 17th century that other European powers, the French, the English, the Dutch started to try and establish colonies uh, with mixed success in the Lesser Antilles, because uh, despite what earlier historians told us, there were in fact very powerful indigenous populations in these islands, in many cases, chasing out the Europeans who, who tried to invade. Um, what this meant was that many of the islands, St. Kitts included, of course, which was shared between the English and French um, in the early colonial period, kind of got batted back and forth between these colonial powers. 
Um, and that means that their history may be dispersed across multiple colonial archives. And so as I was embarking on this project, I was told, well, you're not going to be able to find anything about X, you know, St. Lucia being an example, because it wasn't a colony until 1763. And it's true that you wouldn't, well, that's not a good example. Dominica was not a colony until 1763 when it became a colony of um, Great Britain. And it's true that you wouldn't find things about Dominica in the British colonial archives, but you would in the French colonial archives because there had been an informal settlement. And so if you looked at um, Martinican or Guadeloupian colonial correspondence, there would be a lot of discussion about, hey, what's happening in that island that's between our two islands, right? And same for um, St. Lucia, which was first French and later British. So it, it requires kind of a multi-archival vantage point in order to understand um, this layered colonial history of what's actually happening in the islands. If you accept the fact that the history of the Caribbean only begins at the moment that a given island becomes a formal colony, then you're going to miss all of this other history. And so it, it really requires looking in other places for mentions of what are the Spanish saying about St. Kitts in the 16th century, despite the fact that they have not um, uh, successfully colonized that place. So that's, I feel like I missed part of your question, but from an archival standpoint, that's what I would say, that it really requires kind of um, a multi-archival approach in order to understand um, like the, the real history, right? What's actually happening rather than what colonial powers were um, trying to project what's happening in these spaces. I could add to that, even where you have one, national administration like the British Leeward Islands colony mm -hmm. where you have four separate islands with different past histories as Tessa mentioned of you know multiple nations on one island the the top guys in that administration are corresponding but they're talking about affairs on all those islands you know and the ships are patrolling among all those islands so it really researching a history of just Nevis for instance would require a very big net looking at a lot of other places to capture the information. Yeah, and as um, members of the panel and a few other uh, community members were looking at earlier today, there were maps of, uh, take Guadalupe, for instance, which is really a collection of like eight different islands, if you could, if you count them all, um, but we treat it as one independent entity. Um, so yes, just this idea of multiplicity, um, and and constantly shifting scales is uh, is important. Did you have something to add, Janelle? Yeah, because you talked about the different colonial powers and how that manifests locally. And if you go back to the 18th century when there was all this tug of war between the British, the French, the Spanish, etc., that would have had an impact on the access that we have to archival material today. Because even in Nevis, um, you know, think it's was being shared for a while between the French and the British. And at one point, Nevis being so close, the French in 1706 decided to have an invasion to try and take control of Nevis. And that would have resulted in archival material burning in the streets. Literally, a lot of mm -hmm. things were actively burnt in Trinidad. Um, they became a British colony early 19th century. So they were late to the game in terms of British. And the British had an active policy to try and erase the Spanish history that was so present there. They wanted to stifle that. So I can only imagine that some of the materials would have been removed and maybe even destroyed. And you have to contend with that when you're doing that type of research. Great, thank you all. Um, to consider one final question, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't historicize the region and its multiple um, kind of points of, of overlap with enslavement and the slave economy. How do we as historians, as collection managers and administrators grapple with the fact that these archives were created in many ways by enslavers and how do we respond to that legacy while in the process doing what we can to foreground enslaved people's voices wherever possible and the legacies that they did leave behind even if, as Janelle was just poignantly saying, um, European colonial powers did their best to erase those vestiges. This is for anyone. Okay. As that's a difficult task to grapple with. 
But I think as researchers and historians going in, the first thing that you have to do is investigate critically. So you have to question the sources. You have to question why it was written, by who it was written, and what audience they were writing it for, because that would help to determine whether the, the type of bias that would have gone into writing that particular document. So you have to look at the source, of course, but analyze it in that sense. Coupled with that, you want to be able to value things such as oral tradition, because certain aspects of academia do not value that as a true historical source. But you have to be able to tap into that because a lot of the African voices would have been passed down through that, that medium rather than the tangible archival material. So you want to be able to interrogate all sources so that you can get that voice wherever you can. In terms of archaeology as well, that's another source that you can tap into to be able to get that tangible historical material that can probably or possibly corroborate the type of sources that you're investigating. But at the end of the day, you really just have to question critically and don't take content as this was written, and so this is fact, as well as we have a tendency sometimes as researchers and academics to, if one researcher would have transcribed something before and documented it, we just take their version wholesale, like, yeah, that was already done. You write based on that rather than the original source, which had you interrogated that you would have found a whole different perspective that would shed light to voices of individuals who don't have that voice in a lot of our historical material. Uh, I would like the historian to have the final word on this, but for myself, I will say um, special collections is a place where we deal with difficult materials. And I am 100% for the preservation of all of history, all the voices. Um, and my job with regard to this collection is preservation, discovery, and access. And, uh, and so that I view as my role. But I do think it's you know, more important than ever that we foreground those historically marginalized and disenfranchised voices where we can so that we can explore the full story of, of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Janelle's point about um, bias and really interrogating sources is such an important one. Um, and I think the Caribbean has given us so many um, theorists and thinkers who have allowed us to really grapple with the role of power in the production mm -hmm. of history, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, Eric Williams, Eric Williams to have to have to the Trinidadian one, but uh, Michel of Clio from Haiti, for instance, um, Marisa Fuentes, who uh, is American but works on Barbados really reckoning with um, the production of sources whose perspective is being um, highlighted, valued, and whose is being devalued in those sources and asking us to engage with them really critically. So I think one of the best things we can do going forward is take the, the words of Caribbean people and bear them in mind as we um, engage with the sources that are available to us. I think the other thing that I've been struck by as I embark on a second project, which um, Thomas mentioned um, together with a faculty member in Syracuse's high school, and I'm uh, constructing a digital database and associated book project where after the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, but before the emancipation of enslaved people in the British Empire, um, agents of the British Crown registered every single person who was enslaved in the entire empire. We have an, uh, rosters, basically, for the British Caribbean of 700,000 individuals by name. And what's been done with those um, is a really detailed demographic study, but that doesn't really grapple with the people whose names are contained in these registers as individuals. And in crown colonies, these registers are particularly detailed. And so we're starting with St. Lucia, but we're moving to Trinidad now. And we're um, taking these very bureaucratic lists that were ultimately used actually to compensate former slave owners at the moment of emancipation. And we are using them to counter purposes. They weren't made for, they weren't made to tell the life histories and genealogies of the people whose names they contain, but they can very easily do that. And um, I think the, the plan moving forward is to hopefully partner um, 
with agencies in the islands that we're working on and see what members of the community there want done with these things because it is ultimately their ancestors and their ancestors um, experiences and their family trees that are contained within these documents that have otherwise been used for very bureaucratic purposes and so I think moving forward it's wonderful to have these kinds of conversations because I think exactly what you said about the importance of partnering um, with people on the islands making sure that you are giving back and that you're when you're doing this kind of research you're you're also building something that's useful to the people whose ancestors you're researching sure. and whose history you're researching I think should be at the, the forefront um, of uh, projects dealing with Caribbean history going forward and I think um, that certainly is kind of in the spirit of, of what um, you're doing here at Hamilton so it's wonderful to see. Great thank you all for those very thoughtful answers and I think that's about as good a place as any to end the formal round of the uh, part of this round table. We do have a few minutes um, for a Q&A for anybody here in the audience and then afterwards we invite anybody who's here with us in person to come and look through the honestly stunning um, archival materials that Christian has brought over from the Meineke Lesser Antilles collection. Um, but before that, are there any questions? I see one up there. Well, that's a very important point. Yeah, I feel stupid, honestly, not even thinking about that. But to your question, there's a few Gladstone entries in the index, so we can check that out later. But I happened to pull a broadside from Trinidad declaring martial law. The year on it is 1823. And we were saying, what happened in 1823? Well, it must have been British-wide lockdown in, in reaction to the slave revolt that you're talking about. So that's a pretty amazing coincidence because yeah. we didn't know that. I just was like, here's a cool big broadside. I'll pull this one out for the table. So we're going to have a look at that. Yeah, I think um, your questions are, are, um, are amazing. Thank you so much. I think we would all agree, or I'll at least speak for myself um, and welcome others to speak, um, that it's imperative to, as we've hit on throughout this talk, to look at the Caribbean, both in terms of um, multiple diasporas, multiple scales, and, and multiple temporalities, um, which I say that to, um, to say, yes, we, we, um, it's very important to consider places like Guiana as Im imperative to the Caribbean um, fabric of the past and, and future. Um, and just also thank you for those wonderful um, and thought-provoking questions. Yeah, I mean, one thing I learned in getting into this field, all that technology for sugar that necessitated these slave economies, if I remember correctly, comes from those 
coastal, like Suriname, Guyana, into the islands because they had tried to grow rice and indigo, tobacco, and and you know didn't really work out so well. And then Virginia is growing tobacco, so then oh, here's this sugar technology. So that is very very key to the whole story. Other questions, anybody? Or? Okay, then thank you. Oh, do you have a question? Okay. Well, yeah, he acquired them from some dealers, uh, but he also did travel in the region. His family had um, the SNH Green Stamps premium program. And so they, they became extremely wealthy, endowed the library at Yale, the Beinecke Library, which Thomas now is a grad student at Yale. And he, he cites the Beinecke collection and what happens? Um, yeah, whenever I say that my work started in the Beinecke Lester and Tilly's collection at Hamilton College in upstate New York, everyone goes, no, you, that must have been here in New Haven, the, 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 big, the bigger Beinecke here. And people tell me I'm wrong frequently. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so anyway, um, this was his personal passion was Caribbean history. And so, uh, and he opted to put it here because he knew at a smaller institution like Hamilton, it would be a major jewel in the crown. I mean, we really have three major special collections, whereas at a Yale or a Harvard, it'd be one of you know hundreds of, of really amazing collections. Ezra Pound, uh, the Communal Societies Collection, and then the Lesser Antilles Collection. But do we know why Beinecke was interested in the Lesser Antilles? Like it... He was a sailing enthusiast from what I've read. Um, there, if anyone's interested, I have a little speech he gave that explains that, that I could mm -hmm. send as a PDF. But I think in a nutshell, he had money and leisure and he loved to sail around the Caribbean and became very interested in its history. And you know, to his credit, preserved a huge amount of amazing materials. 1,800 manuscripts are digitized in the online collection. And then we have thousands of books, prints, paintings, et cetera. You mentioned how a lot of people now can't read cursive, much less the cursive of 200 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which I have difficulty reading, just some of it, just, you know, lots of extra colored views, mm -hmm. making letters different ways. But is it possible yet to transcribe these by computer? Okay, so the gentleman sitting next to me did full transcriptions from the two manuscripts of this doctor record that he supplied to us very graciously to the lady sitting behind you, Lisa McFall, and she can take those and carve that electronic text up so that image, page image for, for electronic text are married. And so you can search the text of the document, you know, just like you would control F search anything, and the computer will take you to the either the image of the page where your word is, or you can just look at the raw text. Um, but transcription of handwritten text, I haven't seen any really successful. I've yeah. seen some attempts to do the transcription digitally, but they're really inaccurate. They're really, really inaccurate. Um, so yes, it does take hours of late nights and uh, using the hard copy and photos to zoom in and is that, a, is that curving left on that letter? Or is that the start of a new one? Uh, yeah, who knows? And he was doing French too. So I mean, you know, he's one even one step further in terms of difficulty. Yeah, I'll say we, we ran into something similar um, in terms of transcribing these registries of enslaved people that uh, I was talking about. We started with St. Lucia where the registry is about 90% in French because even though it had become a British colony in the early 19th century, everybody was still speaking French. So they just let them register in the language that they knew. Um, and my partner in the School of Information Studies tried to run um, optical character recognition, OCR, on it. And he just said, this produces a, a totally garbled text. And so there's still value to learning paleography. <laughs> this is, take this to your students, right? And so we, we had to find, and this is harder at Syracuse University than maybe it would be at Hamilton, uh, students who could read Ninth, early 19th century French. And let me tell you, they are few and far between. Uh, but we did find some and um, they they were able to to transcribe this. But it, it certainly, I think the, the kind of work that you did there is 
still really necessary in order to make these um, handwritten documents a lot more accessible. Emma, do you want to say a sentence or two about working with the 17th century English things you're working with right now? I mean, not to put you on the spot, but you're doing this right now. <laughs> Thank you. That work sounds fascinating. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, do we have any final questions before we um, invite you down to look at the materials? It, oh, yes, Brian. Thank you all. Um, we'd like to say thank you to the AHA Latin American Studies uh, Association for hosting us. And also thank you to Mackenzie Cooley for pulling us all together. And thank you to you as the audience for your engagement and questions. Now, uh, It's true, yeah, and, and I would just say we don't require people to wear gloves. We do ask for clean hands, and I will say that with the materials out here, um, you you should just really look at the pages that are open. Uh, some of these are, are more fragile, but, um, but if you're in the classroom, we would set it up a little differently, so no gloves. <laughs> all right, thank, thank you all. Oh, well. <laughs> Hey, thanks for coming. So this is Joe Shelley. Hi. Good night. It's a pleasure.